Well, uh, when, when Jack asked, uh, asked me to, to speak here today, I was thrilled and scared because getting to do a symposium like this with uh, Jack Holliday, is, that's no small uh, task. And um, you know, Jack, as you uh, may or may not know, d demands excellence in pretty much everything that he does and everything that, that you do if you're involved with it. Um, so you know, the, we knew this would take some, some uh, definite time and energy, but it always pays off because we always learn so much when we're involved in any project with him. So Jack, thanks for the opportunity to, to be involved. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be presenting some so a, a case study, I'm going to show you two eyes on a, uh, on a post-refractive patient. And I'd just like to acknowledge our, um, our research fellow, uh, Dr. Gueva, here in the uh, second row. Uh, Larissa, if you want to just raise your hand. Um, <clears throat> this was her first uh, project with us. Uh, and and it was I think it was on our first day with me, and I said, oh, by the way, um, you're going to help me with a project for Jack Holiday, and I need it in, in a couple hours. And, you know, she did an incredible job. So um, her mom, who's also in the second row, should be very proud. So our first case here is a 60-year-old female who had myopic LASIK uh, in 2001 um, and uh, was looking f to get back on track. She wanted improvement uh, at all distances uh, without the use of reading glasses. You can see the amount of anisometropia here, uh, primarily uh, spherical and with her dominant right eye, um, but the left eye had nuclear sclerosis, which probably accounted for a myopic shift. So Dr. Holliday expertly took us through his, um, his planning software, and here's our first page. And I just want to kind of show you how we uh, uh, use this. So first off, what we see here is an oblate profile of a, of a, a decent-sized myopic ablation. It looks relatively well-centered uh, and, <clears throat> and, and uniform. But what's neat is that when we look at our, the, the EKR and the EKR mean, we have some zonal information like Dr. Holliday just taught us. But what we also have at, at basically at a glance is not only the total spherical aberration profile, which we feel is really important when we're looking at matching up IOLs uh, with uh, corneal ablations, but also now we have additional information um, such as the estimated pre-refractive K. Now, and that goes one step further based off of uh, um, the radius of curvature, uh, expected radius of curvature change and differential is about 82% front to back. Um, and this now, Jack has calculated this for us. We can actually get a sense of how much this patient actually was treated. So if I was just to stop right there, I feel like I could walk off the stage because that contribution alone is massive. I mean, for the first time, we have, at a glance, uh, a calculator that shows us what the pre-K was in a post-refractive cornea. Think about the power of that. No pun intended. So how do we use it? Well, first off, we're going to use the spherical aberration information, and we're going to match that and customize the IOL choice based on the spherical aberration. If, if we went back, actually, and I showed you this spherical aberration, this is uh, 0 0.60 microns, 0 0.61 microns of positive spherical aberration. And you can see that. You actually don't need the, ab the aberometry to tell you that. You can just see how, how um, oblate uh, this cornea is. So what do we want to do? We want to pick the highest negative spherical aberration profile lens available, which happens to be the Technus platform in the United States. Okay, so we ch chose a Technus platform with um, 0.27 microns of negative spherical aberration to try to offset as much of that positive spherical aberration that we could uh, use. Now, this is where this gets kind of neat. Here, historically, we did not have uh, lenses uh, that presbyopia correcting lenses that we would feel would be appropriate for this patient. But because now we have advanced software like Jack has created and advanced IOLs with extended depth of focus lenses, we actually feel like we can access these patients. So when we run through our normal routine and look at our ASCR, ASCRS post-refractive calculator without historic data, uh, what do we see? We get about an 18, it looks like about an 18 diopter um, uh, IOL that we should choose for a plano target. Now, in the AXL, and actually, um, I, want to, I applaud uh, um, Dr. Conan for his research, uh, basically showing that we can use this um, 
in addition or in lieu of an optical biometer like an IOL master. And we've actually validated this work as well in our center and shown the same thing. So we also did the comparison between AXL and IOL master 500 and did not find a difference. And, and that this uh, paper has been submitted for publication recently. So when we look at this and we don't have the pre-op information, then this basically we get a spread between two non-historic IOL calculators that's pre-populated in the AXL for us for post-refractive calculators between a 19 diopter and an 18 diopter lens. But when we uh, take Jack's information, now we can take that estimated pre-op K, we actually can put it into the pre-op K um, refractive surgery calculator here and automatically now we have two double K formulas additionally to choose from. I mean, this is fabulous stuff. This is like what we've been waiting for, for I don't know, since we've been practicing. And what we find is all of a sudden things get much tighter. Now we have 18 diopters across the board with a pair of double K formulas that, um, that also agree with one of the non-historic uh, methods, also agree with the ASCRS calculator. But what about intraoperative aberrometry? Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? The, subjective, the suggested power in this was 18. So now we have a real-time measurement in the OR, agreeing with all of our double K formulas based on Jack's work, and what now what if we go back and then put that, the suggested power, we ended up choosing not an 18, but an 18.5, why? Well, friends, this is where the art of medicine comes into play. What I didn't point out to you was the axial length. Well, let's look, the axial length here is almost 26 Mill, mill, millimeters. 26 millimeters is a long eye, so we need to adjust for that. So I'm going to go with a slightly myopic target to, um, to, to, to try to balance out um, any error that might result from an, an extra long eye based on Doug Koch's uh, 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 work. So we went with an 18.5. So what happens when we plug that in retrospectively back into these, uh, into the, um, uh, into the formulas? It ends up actually agreeing with the aura. So this is very, very encouraging. And how did we do? We did pretty well. This patient was ecstatic, all right? So that was her first eye, 2015 J3, in a, in a, in a minus four myopic ablation and uh, without historic case uh, by um, paper, but because of Jack's work, that, that helped us out there. So let's look at her other eye real quick. Same story, um, oblate. We look at her EKR, get a sense of what her true uh, Ks are. That includes the anterior and posterior uh, cornea. Um, and when we look at the total spherical aberration, again, 0.5. So this is a large amount of spherical, uh, positive spherical aberration. And then um, we're going to look. We have her estimated pre-Ks provided. Looks like she's had about a three diopter ablation. And, um, and then here we have uh, just looking at uh, kind of getting a gestalt for her zones. We take the same plan here, highly negative spherical aberration IOL, but this is just neat. ASCRS calculator gives us, suggests a 19 diopter lens without historic information. And when we have the addition of two non-historic calculators in the AXL, we get a spread between 18.5 and 19.5. And that's a pretty typical situation. So what do you do? You still have to make a choice. Well, thankfully, we now have Pre-populated, we can we can populate this with the with the estimated pre-refractive surgery Ks. We now have the addition of two double K formulas that pop up that agree 18.5 across the board now. And so that gives us a lot of confidence moving in to surgery where we now have intraoperative aberrometry. And guess what it suggests? 18.5. Exactly agrees with what Jack predicted with his estimated pre-op Ks, and when we run it through the calculators. But what did I do? I didn't pick that because why? This is a long axial myope, 26 millimeter eye, so I was fudged a little bit on the nearsighted side of things. And this is what's so cool. When I go back and retrospectively run this, look at Jack's formula, Bo bottom left. Not only, this is his double K formula, by the way. When I run his pre-op Ks, pre-LASIK Ks, through his double K formula, it estimates zero, minus 0 0.36 target, which is what I chose with a 19 diopter, minus 0 0.35. Jack, can you try a little harder? You missed it by a hundredth of a diopter. Okay, and guess what? Did great. 
So um, anyways, this is a real contribution uh, and, and it, what, what we think is really a critically helpful tool for the post-refractive IOL patient. Uh, as Jack just taught us, EKR65 provides true corneal power, but it's these estimated pre-Ks that really are a game changer for us. And I look forward to uh, getting to discuss this case and, and, and um, learn from the rest of my panel here shortly. Thank you.